blessing. And it is good to be saved. Amen. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Amen. God is good. Hebrews chapter number 3 in your Bibles. Hebrews chapter number 3. All right. As we jump back into this, last week we looked at uh, the uh, warning about waiting. We saw that in verse number 7 in the first part of verse number 8. As we looked at that and we were looking at how Paul once again quoted another section of the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter number 95. And uh, he was quoting David in an exhorter to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ to the Hebrew Christians. And I'm going to show a little bit of a doctrine today out of this passage. I'm trying not to jump ahead too much because these next sections all the way into chapter number four really are all together. And, uh, and I'm going to have to use a little bit of it uh, in these next couple of verses, but uh, try not to get too much because I want to kind of keep a little bit for the next verses that I preach as I unfold this to you. And uh, Romans chapter number 15, verse number 4, the Bible says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Can I get a witness right there? Now we have a great hope. Amen. First Corinthians chapter number 10, verse number 11. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. In Galatians 3.24, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. God wants you to respond in faith. Amen. God wants you to respond by trusting him. I'd like you to notice the second of these three truths that are vital, uh, vitally important for our Christian life. And they're vitally important for every Christian. Amen. So we looked at the warning about waiting. We saw the author of truth. We saw the attitude about time. And we saw the alarm about tenderness when it said, harden not your hearts. And this morning, as we jump into this, the second thing I want you to notice, not only the warning about waiting, but also a witness about wandering, a witness about wandering. Father, we sure do love you. We thank you for your goodness and grace. I pray now that you'd fill me, use me, guide and direct me as I preach your word. I pray, dear God, that you'd open up every heart and mind to the understanding of your word, but also to the application of it, Lord. And I pray, dear God, that we would all be impacted this morning by your presence and by your word. I pray you'd help us now do that which is needed in each one of us. Thank you so much for working and moving in a special way. Thank you for your presence. And Father, I do pray now that you'd work and move as only you can. You are so awesome. In Jesus' precious holy name we pray, the power of his blood we plead. Amen. And so we see here a witness about wandering. As it mentions in this verse number 8, as we look at this, we see that next phrase, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. That word, as in the provocation, that statement is talking about, uh, uh, which Paul is quoting from Psalm 95 in the letter to the Hebrew Christians, he is quoting it to remind Remind them of a darker part of Israel's history. As Israel was delivered from Egyptian slavery, they sang the song of Moses in Exodus 15 1 I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. And as they're singing this, they're coming out. They've seen the Egyptian army drowned in the Red Sea. They've seen that they came through on dry ground with those walls of water on either side of them. And they came across, when they got to the other side, they were so afraid of that Egyptian army, which at that day was the greatest army in the world. And they were delivered. And they came out, they sang this song, Miriam was singing, all of them were singing, they were having a time, amen? And I don't know about you, but I like having a time in the Lord. And so, and they're coming out and all of these things are happening, but you know what? Not too shortly after they got out, they got thirsty. And they came to a place where the water was bitter. 
And they started to murmur against Moses, the man of God, and begin to complain and murmur and all of these things. And, God, and Moses prays to God. God shows them a, a tree. He takes a branch from that tree. He throws it in the water and makes the water sweet. Amen. And then they got to drink of that living, that living water in a sense, if you understand what I'm saying. And so all of these things are happening. And they, they listen, they had an opportunity to go straight to the promised land. Now, I know they had some things they had to, they had to build the tabernacle. Moses had to go to Mount Sinai, get the Ten Commandments and the commands of God, and all of those things were taking place, and they traveled across there. But literally, from when they parted from the Red Sea to where, they, where the promised land was, it was only about an 11-day journey for them to travel. It's only about 11 days. Only about 11 days. That's all it was. And so they traveled. They, they had some things to do. And so a few days into this and not too long into it, they're traveling along and, and they get over there. And what did they decide to do? They decide to have 12 men, one from each tribe, one man from each tribe to go into the land and to spy out the land. And they were out there about 30 days spying out the land. And they saw the milk and the honey. They saw the, the grapes of escrow and all of that stuff. They saw all of these things happening. They are seeing all of this. And they took and they cut some of those. I mean, they had to carry it. It was so much grapes on there. They had a couple of men carry those things back. And, and it's an amazing thing. And I mean, it's all of that. And they get back. And Joshua and Caleb were like, let's do it. <laughs> but the other ten gave an evil report. They gave an evil report about this whole situation. And they started to murmur and complain and weep and cause a gripe. Boy, how sad. I mean, they could have went into the promised land at that point in time and been victorious. If they would have just obeyed God and went in and said, God, how do you want us to attack? Where do you want us to go in at? But instead, they went in and sent these spies in to check out the land and boy, it came back, and it was a bad thing. And so we look at this, and we see this, a witness about wandering. A witness about wandering. And so the first thing I want you to see is it is a witness of disobedience. It was a witness of disobedience. What was only supposed to take a few days turned into 40 years. What was only supposed to take a few days turned into 40 years. I want you to think on that and chew on that for a while while I preach to you. I mean, just a, a couple, let's look at a couple of promises from God that he made the Israelis before they ever got there. Turn over to Exodus chapter number 19 with me. Don't lose your place in Hebrews chapter number 3. Exodus chapter number 19 in your Bibles. Exodus chapter number 19. I want you to see this. Exodus chapter number 19. I mean, he has already delivered them. Exodus chapter number 19. He's getting ready to go get the 10. Moses is getting ready to go up on Mount Sinai, receive the 10 commandments. They're doing all of this. He's getting basically up there, getting the 10 commandments, getting the law of God and all of these different things. And, and it's an incredible time. Exodus chapter number 19. Look at verse number five with me when you get there. And when you do get there, give me a good Amen. Look at verse number five. Now, therefore, if ye will obey what? My voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above what? All people for all the earth is what? Don't you love that? I'm glad for that. Amen. And so we see that promise there. Now flip over to chapter number 23 after he's gotten the Ten Commandments. There's been some more things happen. Look at verse number 22. He makes another promise. These are just a couple. They're, they're, it's loaded. The promises are loaded to the children of Israel here. Look at verse number 22. Uh, tw I mean, chapter 20, no, 23, 22. 23, 22. 23, 22. Look at what it says. But if thou shalt indeed, what? Obey his voice and do all that I speak. Then I will be an enemy unto thine what? And an 
adversary unto thine adversaries. That's another great promise. He is telling the children of Israel, hey, listen, if you'll just obey my voice indeed, then I, you'll be a peculiar people to me. You'll be a special treasure to me. Now, I don't know about you, but I can imagine uh, I, 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 in my marriage, I, my wife is a special peculiar, a, a special treasure to me. I love her. She is a sweet treasure to me. Amen. And she's precious to me. And I hope she, I'm her, I'm her treasure too. Amen. And, uh, uh, you know what I, you know what I mean? And I don't know about you as a child of God, man, I don't want to be a disobedient kid that God has to constantly correct. I want to be a peculiar treasure to him. I want to be somebody when God looks at me, he looks down at me, he says, wow, that's my boy right there. I'll tell you what, over the years, I've been able to look at Brother Devin, and I've been able to say, look at that right there, that's my son. Hear him preach a message where he's really getting with it, and I'm sitting back there, and I'm like, Woo, that's my boy right there. Amen. I'll tell you what. And, and, and to see that, to have that, and is what a tremendous blessing that God would look and see, you know what? That's my boy right there. But you know how it's going to be? It's by doing things that please God. And boy, as we look at this, this witness about wandering, it was a witness of disobedience. And God gave them a couple of, of promises. They would be, a, if they would just obey, they would be a peculiar treasure unto God above all people of the earth. But not only that, in Exodus chapter number 23, your enemies, they'll be my enemies. And boy, I'll tell you what, to have God say that is a powerful thing. And those that are adversaries to you, oh, they'll be an adversary to me as well. And boy, I'll tell you what, the people that are, that are adversaries to you as a child of God, when you're obeying the Lord, they're going to benefit. And I'm here to tell you something right now. As a child of God, when you're living in the ebb and flow of Christianity and you're just, you're hitting on all cylinders, even lost people that are good to you get blessed. Are you with me? And the people around you. And, and you know what that does? That makes those people be like, hmm, there's something definitely different about that individual. There's something definitely different. You know what? I just got to get a little bit closer to this individual because when I'm close to him, good things happen in my life. And they'll be like, what is that? Well, that's called Jesus Christ, amen, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It is a witness about disobedience. Sadly, they didn't listen. They forgot. They were easy to forget. And if, if you could get an amen right there. We have that tendency as well. Now I'd like you to turn over to Exodus chapter number 17. I want to look at a few things here. Exodus chapter number 17. Exodus chapter number 17. We see here that water of, 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 of uh, the bitter water I, I mentioned. Look at verse number 2. Wherefore the people did what? Chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide you with me? Wherefore do you tempt the what? Lord. Oh, child of God, don't tempt the Lord. Look at this. What, what, what did they do to tempt the Lord? They complained. They gave the man of God a hard time. <laughs> That's what they did. And man, I'm telling you, it's a dangerous thing to do. Look at, numbers, or look at verse number 7 as well. Scroll on down to verse number 7. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they what? Tempted the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? Now we're talking about people that had just come out of Egyptian bondage, slavery. God's delivered them and brought them into the wilderness. They saw the 10 plagues. They saw the miracle of the parting of the waters. They walked around across on dry ground. They turned around, and when the Egyptian army was hot on their heels, whoosh, gone. And here they are, just a few days later, complaining and chiding because they didn't have anything to drink. Instead of having faith in God, Instead of going to Moses and say, we don't have anything to drink, could you, in, 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 could you talk to the Lord for us? Could you, could you ask the Lord what we need to do to get some water? Because we know our God is great. Amen? 
It's called faith in God. Now turn over to Numbers chapter number 13 with me. Numbers chapter number 13. I want you to see this. Numbers chapter number 13. I'm building something here, so hang in there. Numbers chapter number 13. We're going to take a look at also where they spent the, sent the spies in to, uh, when they were at Kadesh Barnea. They sent the spies in and the spies come back. Look at verse number, uh, let's see here, verse number 26. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel under the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely, and surely, just as God said the land would be that he was going to give them. Surely, this should have been enough of evidence for them because God said it. Amen. Now, if they'd have gotten to a land and it was nothing but desert and drought and problems, then maybe they should have a reason to complain a little bit and to doubt. But that's not what happened. God said it was a land flowing with milk and honey. And they got there, and guess what? It was an exceeding good land. Look at what it says. Flow with the milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. And nevertheless, the people be strong. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. And the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. And the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that... We saw in it are men of great stature. And listen to verse number 33. And there we saw the what? Giants, giants the sons of Anak, which come, to the, uh, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. Now let me ask you a question. The children of Israel have just been delivered from 400 years of bondage. Now, before they went into bondage, what took place? There was a great famine in the land in Exodus. There was seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. And you know what? In the seven years of famine, after seven years of plenty, the only nation that was prepared for it was Egypt. And why? Because there was somebody that was the right hand of the king, and his name was Joseph. And you know what? In those seven years of plenty, the Bible says that all people had to come to Egypt to survive. And you know what? I would dare say that some giants that were in the land, why would it be any different for them? I would dare say that each one of these nations that were in Canaan land, just 11-day journey away from Egypt, had to come to e Egypt in that day to get their sustenance. And so God just defeated a nation that was a nation that was ruling the known world, drowned them in the Red Sea. And they go to this place and they say, we can't overcome them. They just God just defeated the greatest army in the world for them. And they totally forgot about it. How many times do we get doubtful of God and not take the time to do as it says so many times in the Bible? Remember. 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 So often we forget. We're praising God one day, the next day comes, oh no, what are we going to do? Are you kidding me? 
Are we that weak as a child of God that, that we can't look back at the victory after victory after victory after victory after victory of what God has done for us? I mean, just stop and chew on it for a while. Solid Rock Baptist Church prayed and fasted for some seasoned laborers to come in. And we've got a preacher and his precious wife, a piano player, amen? This is the, like, I think one of the first, no, no, we've had two before. But anyways, this is this has been a while since we've had two piano players. And, and she says she's going to try and learn, relearn the, the organ, amen? Hallelujah. And I don't mean to put you on the spot. But uh, I have prayed for 13 years for that, amen? I have kept an organ over here for almost all 13 years. And so, listen, it doesn't have foot pedals, so it'll be a little bit easier, amen? And so, praise the Lord. I'm telling you right now, listen, God answers prayer. Amen. God's powerful. God's magnificent. So, listen, if God says it, just obey it. He's so faithful to us, amen? He is an amazing God. These 10 just totally destroyed the faith of the people. Look at what it says in verse number 1. And all the congregation lifted up their voice, chapter number 14, and cried. And the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel, how many of the children? The children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. Can you imagine? Fear. I mean, you stop and think of all the miracles they've seen. They've already battled while they were traveling across. I mean, they've already seen God do some great things. They've seen God uh, give water out of the rock. They've seen the manna come down from heaven where they gathered. They didn't have to work for their food. They just had to go and pick it up. And the Bible talks about in a later place in all of these 40 years that, that as, as the kids grew, their clothes grew with them. Have you ever seen that? I have never seen a pair of sneakers on a kid grow with them. Are you with me? I've never seen a pair of, of pants grow on a young boy as they're growing up. You know what happens? All of a sudden, those pants get shorter and shorter. Amen? And I guess today that's the new fad. Amen? And so, and I guess not wearing socks too. But anyways, and uh, praise the Lord. Amen? Everything comes from California. And so as we look at this, we see this right here. I'm telling you right now, it is incredible the, the fear that they had. And the God that showed them so many miracles, they doubted. Look at what it says, verse number 3, And wherefore hath the Lord brought us, no, scrolling down a little bit further, Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel, and Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes and they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their defense has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But all, do you see that? All the congregation bade stone them with what? Boy, what a, what a terrible thing. Because they did not trust and believe God. Listen. It was disobedience. They outright disobeyed God and would not go into the land. They were going to set up a captain and go back to Egypt. That's what they had decided to do. That's what was going to happen. And then the glory of the Lord appeared and turned the story once again. But the problem was is when the glory of the Lord appeared, they had this matter of disobedience. They already said they're not going to go in. Then not only that, they defied God's command as well. Because after that, 
Moses, God gave a word and they were afraid of what God said was going to happen to them. And then they decided, well, let's go in. And God said, don't go in because now you'll be destroyed. And what did they do? They defied God. They disobeyed him and then they defied God. They defied him and they decided to go in. It, it, it really was a lot like, you know what? When you look at the Bible and it talks about child rearing. And, you know, when me and Mrs. Frost were raising our kids, we had the four D's of discipline. And if they disobeyed outright disobedience, go take out the trash, they didn't do it, they were in trouble. They were going to get disciplined for it. And it wasn't like there wasn't ever any grace or any of those kind of things, but if they disobeyed and they didn't take out that trash and they knew they should have taken out that trash, oh, but they already knew when they disobeyed because we laid out the rules to them. They understood what was going to happen. They knew what was going to happen. So they chose to take the risk. If mom and dad remember, then they hoped that we wouldn't. You know, God doesn't forget. Right. And so the four disobeyed. Listen, if they disobeyed, guess what they got? They got a spanking. And there was a set number of, of whoopings on that bottom. Are you with me? And so there's the four D's. There was disobedience, but there was also defiance. It was defined going completely against, not just disobeying, but doing the opposite of. And then totally in a defiant attitude. Or if they did obey, but they did it with a defiant attitude. You may be able to make me do this, but I'm not going to like it. You know, the little boy that I'm going to sit down, but I'm standing up on the inside. Ha, 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 so cute, so funny. Not so, amen. It's not cute and it's not funny. And so we see the, the D's there, but not only another D was de deceit, deceit to lie. If they got caught in a lie, they were in trouble. And then the fourth one was disrespect. If they were disrespectful, not just to me, but to other people as well. If they were disrespectful, it, it was, you know, sometimes I see parents that make them, their kids respect them, but then right in front of them, they'll disrespect some other adult. And I'm like, are you kidding me? You're going to let them disrespect some other adult, but just because they didn't respect you, you're not going to do anything. Uh-uh, amen. <laughs> We're not going to have it. I'm not going to raise a disrespectful kid. I'm not going to raise a, a defiant kid or a deceitful kid or a disobedient kid. And you know what? You can find examples of God disciplining people that did these things. And so as we look at this, we see this matter. There was, there was some serious issues going on with the children of Israel. They had disobeyed. It was a witness of disobedience. And so go over to Proverbs chapter number 23. I, I know this is kind of out of the way and not really, but somebody's listening online, I'm sure, somebody with kids and stuff like that. And I know people will, will uh, listen and uh, check it out later on YouTube and stuff like that. So I want to give these nuggets. And so go over to Proverbs with me. Proverbs uh, uh, chapter number uh, 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 20, I think it is, uh, what is it, 20-something uh, here. Where did I go? 23. Proverbs chapter number 23. Now, there's a lot about discipline in the Bible. And so I've heard people say, well, that's Old Testament. <laughs> Listen, if you're going to live that kind of Christianity, you might as well just cut your Bible in half and get rid of half of it. The Old Testament is still valid today, Amen. It is still the law that leads us. It is a schoolmaster under the grace of Christ. Chapter number 23, look at it with me, and I want you to see this verse. I think this is so vitally important. If there's ever a verse that, that ought to cause people to do right when it comes to this matter of raising their kids, look at 23, look at verse 13 and 14. 23, 13, and 14. If you're there, say amen. amen. Withhold not what? Correction. Correction from the child. Now, here there's a description of what correction is. For if thou what? Beatest him with a what? You ought not do it with your hand. You ought to do it with a paddle. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not what? Die. Verse number 14. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from where? Do you know how important it is this matter of disciplining the way God says to. And it's not a matter of having a better way. 
It's not a matter of baby being able to, well, kids have all kinds of different personalities and all of this. And, 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 and the truth is, is some kids are more disobedient than others, and I understand that. But the simple fact of the matter is, as you're raising them, it's not a matter of a better way of doing it. It's a matter of obedience to the Lord, period. To not obey this passage is to disobey God. Are you with me? Child Rearing 101 from the Bible. And the Bible talks about chastening in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, in the book of Hebrews in chapter number 12, did not we get chastened by our fathers? It talks about it. And so it's not like it's exclusively Old Testament. This is just wisdom. And if you want your kids, if, listen, there may be some occasions where people have gotten saved and they never got spanked in their life. But I would rather not go with the exception than the rule. Because this is pretty important. And it very clearly says if there's ever a passage that's, a, listen, it's obedience, a matter of obedience. It's not a matter of if there's a better way or not. Nobody has a better way than what God's described. And the simple fact is, last I checked, kids are still sinful. And you look at these young people today that are growing up and getting out in the world and how they're living their lives and what they're doing to their bodies that have never been spanked. God help us. Are you with me? 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, verse number 32, the Bible says, But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the what? World. And boy, it's so vitally important. If God the Father chastens his children... We ought also to do the same. Obedience is so important to God. God said in Jeremiah chapter number 11, verse number 7 about this uh, in his plea to the children of Israel. Jeremiah 11, 7, the Bible says, For I earnestly protested unto your fathers in the day that I brought them up out of the land of Egypt, even unto this day, when Jeremiah was trying to tell the people of Judah, to, to submit to Babylon, and they would not do it. And it says here, even unto this day, rising early and protesting, saying, obey my voice. God, throughout all the ages, has cried out to the children of Israel and to his children, just obey my voice, obey my voice, obey my voice. You're either going to obey or you're going to pay. That's not the words of Jim Frost. That's a word of God. And Jesus said in John 14, 6, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. Turn over to 1 John chapter number 5 with me. 1 John chapter number 5 in your Bibles. 1 John chapter number 5, if you would please. 1 John chapter number 5. I want you to see this passage. So vitally important. 1 John chapter number 5. Listen. Don't bristle up. Don't resist the word of God. Don't resist the preaching of the word of God. Amen. Let God have his way in your heart and life today, whatever may be the case. Whatever God's dealing with you about, just do it and trust him. He is faithful. 1 John chapter number 5. Look at verse number 1 when you get there. Give me a good amen. amen. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of who? God. And everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. And so one of the main things about this matter is, is the children of God ought to love one another. Can I get a witness? Yeah. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and do what? Keep his commandments. Keep his commandments. This is how you know if somebody really loves God and loves his brother. Why? They keep his commandments. They do what God says. This is the proof of true Christianity. When somebody's living right and acting right, and look at it in verse number three, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. This is the what? Love of God. That we what? Keep his commandments. There's a good definition for the love of God, keeping his commandments. Are you with me? Now look at what it says. And his commandments are not what? Grievous. 
They're not grievous. Listen, I was reading one of the commentaries, and this statement was in there, and uh, I don't remember which one it was. And so, anyways, they made this statement. If a person that is in church and faithful to church does not have a relationship with the Word of God, the preaching of the Word of God is going to be feeling like browbeating. Are you with me? It's going to be like abuse instead of good use. Y'all write that down, put my name next to it, amen? And so listen, <laughs> listen, I'm telling you right now, that's what it's going to be like. It's going to be like I'm getting beat up all the time when I go to church. That's because you don't have a good relationship with your Bible. And it's like when I talk about giving money, oh, here he goes again. When I talk about serving the Lord, here he goes again. Listen, that is Christianity, amen. We ought to want to serve the Lord. You know what? I just love the fact, Brother, brother Trey, I, I probably ought to call you a preacher because you're a pastor, a man of God. And so, and uh, 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 the preacher, it's exciting to have him sit in church and say, I, I'm excited about winning Logan County for the Lord. I'm excited to serve the Lord and, and, and praise the Lord, amen. And, and I'm thankful many of you feel that way, and I praise God for that. And so it's a wonderful thing. It's a refreshing thing for a preacher to preach the Word of God and have people to respond to that Word. A journey that should have only taken a few days ended up being for some the rest of their lives. And the Bible talks about that that generation died in the wilderness. Deuteronomy chapter number 1, verses 34 and 35. And the Lord heard the voice of your words and was wroth and swear saying. Now, if God swears about something, you mark it down. It's going to happen. Surely there shall not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land, which I swear to give unto your fathers. Man, that's a scary thing. Amen. The witness about wandering was a witness of disobedience, which caused, which was caused by disbelief. Not only was it a witness of disobedience, but it was a witness of disbelief. Go back over to Hebrews with me, if you would, please. Hebrews. Hebrews chapter number 3. Look at what it says in verse number uh, uh, 8. Once again, harden not your hearts as in the provocation of the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works, what? Forty years. It was a matter of disbelief. Look, uh, turn over, hold your place right there. Turn over to Jude chapter number one. I want you to see this as well. Jude chapter number one makes a mention of this. And it's a, it's a, a difficult passage. Jude chapter number one. Look at verse number five, if you would, please. I will therefore put you in remembrance. Jude chapter number 5, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that what? Believed not. It wasn't just that they disobeyed God. The reason they disobeyed him is because they did not believe him. And truly, listen to this statement. In many cases, disobedience is a sign of disbelief. It's just the truth of it. Now, I know that's not the only reason for it, but boy, it's a pretty strong indicator of it. Can I get a witness? Because they really don't think, well, God won't judge me or something along. They've talked themselves into it somehow, some way. And so we see this. Look over at uh, Hebrews 3:19. I want you to see this. And it says, "So we that they could so we see that they could not enter in because of what? Unbelief. They didn't believe. It was disbelief that caused this problem. So this matter of the the witness of the wandering was a matter of disobedience which was caused by disbelief. And so we see this sad situation this witness of disbelief, this witness of disobedience. And then also, and I'm going to dig into that a little bit more, but it's a witness of destruction. 
is what it was. This wandering was a witness of destruction. And it says for 40 years they wandered. And at the end of those 40 years, every last one of them was dead. Every last one. There was only two that didn't die that actually got to go in. And that was Joshua and Caleb. Now Moses died right before they went in. He allowed them to see it. Now remember, those that rebelled against God, they never even got to see it. And as a matter of fact, the 10 spies that, that gave a bad report, it wasn't too long after that they were dead. They didn't get to wander for 40 years in the wilderness. And so God doesn't mess around. Are you with me? And so look at this now. This matter, it's a witness of destruction. Look at uh, uh, verse number 17 of chapter number 3. I want you to see this. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned? Whose what? Carcasses fell in the wilderness. That's the way I want the end of my life to be referred as, a carcass that fell in the wilderness. No, that's not how I want it to happen, amen? I want there to be, a, 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 what I would desire is, is that if I die before the rapture happens, now I'd prefer to go up in the rapture. I was telling Jen yesterday, I was up on the roof over there, I said, if the rapture happens now, I'm beating you there. And so, you know, and so I'd prefer to go up in the rapture, amen? But if I do lay down this, this body someday, I hope the testimony would be that he finished his course that he remained faithful and he fought a good fight. Amen. I, I would like for people to be able to rejoice over the life of Jim Frost, not to mourn over it. And so as we look and we see in this passage, it was a witness of destruction. Their carcasses fell. And why? Because of disbelief. And sadly, it's so sad to see this take place. Go over to Mark chapter number 16 with me. Mark chapter number 16, this matter of disbelief. It's a scary thing. It's a scary thing. You know, I remember uh, 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 reading about how that um, Lee Robertson said of, of the great, I, I think it was, a, a, was it Highland Park? Highland Park Baptist Church? He said it towards the end of his ministry as a pastor there. He said, I believe that most likely 85% of that church was lost. Only 15%. That was a big church. I mean, it was a great church. He made that statement about his church. And I believe that, if I remember correctly, that was back in like in the early 80s when he made that statement about the church. How sad. How sad. Mark chapter number 16, look at this. And we're talking all the way back in the 80s he made a statement like that. Supposedly the part of the end, end trail of the heyday of fundamentalism. In chapter number 16, look at verse number 16. So many people get tripped up with this, thinking that baptism is a part of salvation. It's not. It's just making a statement. He that believeth and is what? Shall be what? Saved. Saved. And so that's true. Somebody who believes and, and is baptized, they're what? They're saved. But listen to the second part. But he that what? Believeth not shall be what? Damned. It doesn't say that he that believeth not and is not baptized. It eliminates that part of it because baptism has nothing to do with salvation. It's basically stating somebody who does believe and has been baptized, they are saved. Can I get a witness? That's a true statement. But somebody who doesn't believe, they're what? They're damned. They're damned to eternity, an eternity in the lake of fire. How sad is that? And so we see in this matter of it's a witness of destruction. Disbelief is a witness of destruction. Disobedience, in many cases, is a sign of disbelief. And disbelief is definitely a witness of destruction. Turn over to John chapter number 3 with me. John chapter number 3. John chapter number 3. Look at this now. John chapter number 3. We're going to pick it up in that famous verse, verse number 16. John chapter number 3, if you would please. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, what, believeth in him should not perish, but have, what, everlasting life. 
For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be what? Saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is what? Condemned already. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And so we see in this matter, listen, people that don't believe are condemned already. Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world. The world was already condemned. He came into the world to save, to seek and to save that which was lost. And so we see in this passage, this matter of disbelief, Listen, it's a witness of destruction. Look at verse number 36 of our text. He that believeth, or not of our text, but of uh, John 3. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Do you see? This is what the Bible says. It's a witness of destruction. The children of Israel did not believe God. They didn't believe and they were doomed to destruction because of it. Now go over to Ephesians chapter number two with me. Ephesians chapter number two. I want you to see something here very clearly and I'm going to tie this into Hebrews and we're going to be done. You're going to see this. Ephesians chapter number two. I'm just going to take you on a little journey of the gospel. Ephesians chapter number two. Look at verse number 8, if you would, please. For by grace are you saved through what? Faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should what? Boast. And so somebody is going to get saved. It's by grace through what? Faith. And that not of yourselves. It's not works. It's a gift. It can't be earned. And if it cannot be earned, it cannot be kept. Can I get a witness? It is kept by the power of God, as the Bible clearly says. And so, go back over to Romans with me. Romans, if you would, please. Romans chapter number 10. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the what? Word of God. So where do we get our faith? From hearing the Word of God. The Word of God. Not corruptible seed, but what? Incorruptible. I know a lot of people disagree with me on this, but the Bible says we're born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible the Word of God which liveth and abideth forever. And then I just simply want to ask the question, is the NIV corrupted or isn't it? The ESV, is it corrupted or isn't it? I don't know too many men of God that are fundamental independent Baptists that would not have to say that that's the truth. And so personally, I don't believe people can get saved out of those books. I believe they've got to hear some King James Bible in the English in order for them to be saved. They've got to come across it somewhere, somehow, and it's all over the place, so it's very possible. And so it's not like it, you know, but people say, well, I got saved after reading the ESV. I don't believe you. And so anyways, it contains the Word of God. No, it doesn't. It's corrupted. It is not the Word of God. Can I get a witness? Amen. It's not. And so anyways, uh, before I continue to digress, uh, Romans chapter number 10, if you would please, Romans chapter number 10. Look at verse number 10 with me. For with a heart man believeth unto what? Righteousness. That's talking about the righteousness of Christ. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So it's a heart and mouth matter. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall... Uh, we're back, back to verse uh, right. Uh, no, I'm, I'm missing a verse here. Oh, verse number nine. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So you got the resurrection, okay? And then for the heart man believeth unto righteousness and the, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be what? Ashamed. So somebody who is ashamed to talk about Jesus, there's an issue. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Saved. Saved. For how then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a what? Preacher. preacher. Praise God for preachers. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of of them that what? Preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. You know what I believe? I believe Brother, Brother Tracy 
the preacher has some beautiful feet, amen? Now, you keep your shoes and your socks on, brother, amen? Hallelujah. And so anyways, beautiful feet, amen? Hallelujah. Now, turn back over to the book of Hebrews. I want you to go to Hebrews chapter number four, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible defines the gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, verses one through four. And it talks about that the, the scriptures say that uh, 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 that Jesus died for our sins and was buried according to the scriptures. And then it goes on to say that he rose again from the dead according to the scriptures. And so the gospel is defined as his death, his burial, and his resurrection. He paid a price we could not pay on an old rugged cross in a brand new tomb in a place called hell, his soul spent, and he rose again the third day, giving us victory over death, hell, and the graves. Can I get a witness right there? Now look at Hebrews chapter number four. We'll pick it up in verse number one. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us. Now who is he talking to? Hebrew Christians. And I'm going to tie this together and show you the, the point behind of this entire uh, passage. A promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come what? Short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached. If you've heard the gospel of Jesus Christ preached, say amen. amen. If you've been here any long period of time, you've heard it. Now look, as well as unto what? In the Old Testament, those Jews, now it's referencing those that died after the 40 years of wandering, they heard the gospel. They heard the gospel. There's not a different salvation in the Old Testament than the New Testament. Instead of calling on Jesus' name, they called on the Messiah. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter number 4, the last verse, it says, Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. And boy, I'm here to tell you something right now. I believe that Adam and Eve, I believe God preached the gospel unto them after the fall. And that's why they were able to be saved. Because the gospel is what saves people and nothing else. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we see this matter. And, and, and it says, even as we. And it says, as well as unto them. And so this is the same thing. The word preached did not profit them. Why? Not being mixed with what? Faith in them that heard it. For by grace you say through what? Faith. Faith. These people perished. Because they did not have faith in the what? Gospel. And if a person does not receive the gospel, where do they go? Now, so many times I've heard people say that going into the promised land is like a picture of victorious Christian living. And I agree with that. But it is also a picture of heaven. It is also a picture of heaven. And that's the truth of it. And that passage proves it. It proves it because those people that died in the wilderness, it wasn't mixed with faith with them that heard it. And they didn't get into that rest. Now there's two types of rest. There's salvation rest and there's service rest. And we can see that over in Matthew. We'll probably get into it next week. And so as we look at this and we see in this passage, this matter of salvation, the point behind this is, and Paul is bringing this story up because he wanted to make sure that these Hebrew Christians didn't do like those did and do what after they were crying and weeping all night? They started planning to go back where? To Egypt. And he is trying to stop those Hebrew Christians to going back into Judaism, back into a dead works religion. Can I get a witness? Because at this point in time, when Jesus came and showed up on the scene, it was a religion of works. It was not a religion of faith. And so as we look at this and we see in this passage, we see this matter, obey or pay. Obey or pay. Listen, the truth of the matter is, listen, it's a matter of obedience and obedience when somebody does not obey, it kind of indicates that they don't believe. 
Are you with me? And listen, I'm telling you right now, just obey. Because the price that you're going to have to pay for disobedience, it's not a price you want to pay. Because it always costs you more. Just like sin, sin will take you farther than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay. And it'll cost you more than you want to pay. Everyone standing, every head bowed, every eye closed. Obey or pay. Child of God, listen, church, I love you. Obey the Lord. Obey the Lord. Man, get yourself in the ebb and flow of Christianity so the blessings can pour out. As Brother Larry uh, 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 Brown always used to say, get under the spout where the blessings pour out. Get under that spout. Get in the ebb and flow of Christianity. Live your life, a life of obedience to God, and get under there because even your, your, your adversaries, whether, whether lost or saved, the people around you will benefit because of your righteousness and living in a right way with God. It is so vitally important. There was that warning about waiting we looked at last week. Listen, the attitude of time and God's attitude about time is right now. An alarm about tenderness. Don't harden your heart as the children of Israel did in the provocation. They provoked God to anger. You don't want to deal with that. That's a bad way to go. And then the witness about wandering, what should have only taken a few days, cost them the rest of their lives. And you don't want to get in that place. And you know, the thing about it is, is they never, they never really truly got right. They never got right. God is gracious. God is, God is good. It was that next generation that got to go in. And boy, I beg and plead with you, Lord, don't, I beg and plead with you, folks, don't, don't, don't live a life of disobedience from God. Let God have his way in your heart and life. Whatever God's dealing with you about and has been dealing with you about, listen, everybody in this room is pretty faithful to Solid Rock Baptist Church. And I know that being in this church, God's going to be working on you about something. And I plead with you today, why don't you just deal with it? Just take care of it. Just let him have his way. Don't be afraid of what's going to happen. Don't be afraid of, of the, the giants in the land because God's a whole lot bigger than a giant. He is faithful, he is awesome, and he is powerful. And he does want to bless you. Father, we sure do love you and we praise you and we thank you. I pray now that you bless this invitation. Do a work in our hearts and lives that only you can do. And I pray, oh God, you bless the preaching of your word. You are amazing and you are powerful. We love you, we praise you, we thank you. In Jesus' precious holy name we pray, amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If God spoke to your heart this morning, would you slip your hand up as a testimony to heaven? God sees those hands all over the room. Thank you. The piano's going to play. Why don't you come and let God have his way? I'm let him have his way in your heart and life. It's so much better to obey than to have to pay.